you can lay down the struggle and the grind concept. It no longer belongs to you. You can give it up right now. All right. That's what we're going to talk about in this video. I am Tamara Tamu bringing you another Soul Fulfilled episode of Unleashed Alchemy. If you are new here, you are welcome. You have entered into magic. Okay, you have entered into a portal where we talk about engaging with our cosmic self so that we can bring forth the unseen into the scene. So if you have been here, you know that this will be, I think this is part five now of our money series. And we have been talking about how religious and other programming has affected our money flow. Now, you may be asking, what does money have to do with spirituality? Everything, everything, okay? Because to live your soul-fulfilled life, because we're in this human body, yes, there is an exchange for us to receive and to have what we desire. And part of that exchange involves money, all right? We were not put here to work hard for it. We were not put here to struggle for it. But somewhere along the line, we forgot. We let our ego get in the way. We let programming get in the way to cloud our true identity of our cosmic selves that transcends time and space. We allowed programming of religious nature, of family nature, educational uh, programming, societal programming that framed how we experience money but we're shifting that okay so let's talk about the struggle link now i want to say a few things here and we're going to approach struggle using examples maybe examples that you never consider and for a moment i will be or throughout this video i should say i will be reading directly from my book, which is available now in paperback on Amazon, is called Tales of a Money Maven, How Religious and Other Programming Has Fucked Up Your Money. So let's talk about the struggle link. There's so much drama surrounding struggle and the grind. Now, thankfully, that whole struggle culture and nature and idea and grind nature and idea i i think that it's falling away because people are now raising their consciousness level to say wait a minute wait a minute for me to struggle and grind that does not sound like the life that i want that does not sound like the life that i desire it does not sound like the life that i know i deserve to live because it isn't so the drama in the word struggle so i looked up the word struggle from dictionary.com and this is what the definition is of the word struggle to contend with to contend with an adversary or opposing force i also looked up the word grind the grind means to oppress torment crush Okay, those definitions again, according to dictionary.com. Now, I don't know about you, but for me to even read and consider those definitions, just to say them out loud, feels restrictive. As I was reading those, and this happened to be the first time I actually read through the definitions, I could feel my entire body restricting, okay? It gives also those definitions give images of less than desirable conditions. Now to read both of those, it barely took what, maybe 10 seconds, maybe 15 seconds to read both of those. So imagine living with that, that feeling over a lifetime. Some of us have, are, have done that. I have done that. Some of us are doing that right now. 
Can you imagine living with that opposition and living in that restrictive identity for an entire lifetime? Can you imagine what that does to our bodies? What Then what happens is your body, your nervous system becomes accustomed to struggle and grind. Now, what does this have to do with religion? Well, a lot. It, it's very much connected because in religion, at least the one that I grew up in, it was taught that the more that you struggled in life, the harder that you experience life, if everything, if nothing was going right, then that person was deemed to be somehow more favorable by God up there. That somehow that story of struggle made you more accepting accepting or put a label of acceptance on you automatically for a ticket in heaven and one of the stories in the bible that was often used to just justify that fallacy was the story of this person named job who experienced horrific traumatic life giving up things and that story was often highlighted to put a a crown of majesty on a person man or woman who was experiencing just heartache after heartache struggle after struggle bad experience after bad experience over and over and over and over and over again. So what does that do to a person's mind? Well, it causes you to think, well, everything, it, nothing can come easy. And then if something were to show up, then somehow that was a distraction from your relationship with God. Because remember, when you are programmed to believe that struggle is the way of life in all aspects of life, you not, you're not going to believe that anything can come in easy and with flow and in peace. It's going to be looked at as a distraction from a devil of some sort. All right. So. This shows up in, and perhaps this describes you, but think about a person who, if you, and this is an example, think about a person that opposes everything. And, you know, it's one thing to have a differing opinion, but it's another thing to be combative all the time, opposing everything. Think about a person who fights for their right to be right in a conversation. That is an example of a person who has a nervous system that is accustomed to struggle and grind. So they fight to keep their lives coinciding with that programmed identity it shows up in everything yes we're talking about money but this overflows into everything because why because again this is about identity so I'm going to read directly from the book now so when struggle becomes a recurring theme in our lives we start expecting everything we attempt to be complicated this includes relationships, which we anticipate to be difficult, okay? Ease, on the other hand, becomes an unacceptable notion programmed into us by our families and society. It's no wonder that these words have become so ingrained in our culture, appearing in interviews, social media, posts and inspirational speeches. So 
let me pause here. I want to give an example of that. Whenever you hear, and I had to check myself on this. So whenever you hear of, of perhaps an athlete or someone winning an award of some sort, immediately my mind would automatically be ready to latch on to some struggle story. All right. There's an example. That's how that shows up. Now, back to the book. We've come to expect extensive struggle and grind stories from those we consider successful. That thinking perpetuates a struggle cycle. Now, back to the 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 struggle view as it was learned through religion. So, like I said earlier, a person was meant to believe that their struggle, their life struggles, that that put them on a high pedestal to just be able to float into heaven and to be with God for eternity. Well, the thing was, no one ever said when the struggle stopped. Everyone was looking for some type of relief eventually. Well, if in, in their physical life, if they didn't see the relief, if they didn't feel the relief, then they just allowed themselves to just accept struggle as life and the ease would only come when they died and went to heaven. That is no way to live. That's how that shows, another way that that showed up in religion. So I want to bring up another idea as we have associated this, as it associates with the struggle link. So here's this idea of being strong. We on we all have had some types of conversations on the idea of you have to be strong. So we've heard the phrase and we've said it, I've said it. I have to be stronger, stay strong. How many times have you gone to perhaps a, um, a funeral and maybe you heard someone say, be strong? Or we have been advised that at some point in our lives, another way that we may have heard this is that you have to be tough. Most of us have heard either phrase or have been given that advice as children or young adults. So here's, a, here's an example. And I cringe when I see this every now and then. So I have seen little kids, little toddlers, while they're running or walking, they fall. And if the child or when the child has shown discomfort or, you know, a little whine or a little cry, I've seen the parents say, no, you're okay, you're okay. You're tough, right? Now, that parent thinks that they are comforting that child, but what message is that sending to the child? That they can't, that if something is has hurt them, or if they have experienced a an opposing force, in that case, the opposing force is the ground, is the kid hitting the ground, well, what does that imprint onto a child's mind? Okay, if I'm experiencing discomfort, I can't express my emotions. I have to hide them. I have to just maintain my grit and just keep going. That's the message that it sends. And the parents that do this are, they, their intention is love. So they don't even realize that that is the message that they're sending their child, okay? So, now, as I mentioned early, early on in another episode, in another part of this whole series, when adults do that, they think they're prepping their kids, okay? Yet, we must consider how moments and words like these can imprint encoded messages on a young brain that struggle and difficulty are to be expected, and I must be tough. So... We send a message 
that there is no time to process discomfort. So it gets lodged into our nervous system. Why do I keep bringing up the nervous system? Because the nervous system has everything with our identity, has everything to do with our identity. So it gets lodged in our nervous system without us processing the moment when a challenge has presented itself. So now when challenges present themselves, they persist because we somehow think that if we stay tough in a challenge, that if we just grind through it and grit through it, that we're somehow proving ourselves or we're proving our worth somehow. So in in having that having that notion keep having that story play out in our lives then it justifies the persistence of struggle it justifies the persistence of difficulty and we say we justify it by saying well that's just how life is so then the challenge keeps repeating itself over and over and over again so now the challenge it could be the same type of challenge but it may look different but the challenge is playing out because our identity is settled in struggle so now we can apply that to money and now I'm going to read directly from the book for this so many of us persist with programming that we must engage in sacrifices and struggle without asking how much sacrifice. So the sacrifice then continues into a cycle of struggle. We adopt the idea that somehow we must choose between joy and money, fulfillment and money, and passion and money. This traditional view of work and money can lead one to wonder if there is such a thing as having a life complete with work that is so enjoyable that the work doesn't feel like work because you are engrossed in your creative genius, which is your life. Your entire life is a creative genius. So we weren't taught to expect joy and money simultaneously. We weren't taught to see joy and money as mutually exclusive. We weren't taught to have joy and money and that struggle and grind must accompany the process of life. That struggle and grind must accompany the process of attaining money. That is not the case. If we shift our perspective, we can change this perspective by accessing the source within, which leads us to a process, an everlasting identity, an everlasting work. And what do I mean by work? And I'm not talking about work in the traditional sense, but working in, in, in a way, well, let's talk about career. Your career can be what you're passionate about not what you should do or what you have to do. You can create money by doing everything that you love. Excuse me, and passing out what you the parts of that that don't love that you don't love. So if it's a business that you want, you can create money focusing on the parts in your business that are joyful to you. So I'm going to read this again, this last part. We change our perspective by accessing the source within. What is accessing the source within going to do for us? It is going to unleash that identity that knows that it has an inheritance, nothing that you have to work for, something that is already yours. It is an inheritance that you have, an inheritance of what? Freedom, joy, fulfillment, peace, and lavish amounts of money simultaneously. It goes together. 
the way that you acquire money, love, joy, peace, freedom, it all goes together. So we don't have to carry this struggle and grind and this sacrifice identity anymore. It is not ours. So let's get back to the truth. Let's get back to our true identity. Let's allow that, that identity to be unleashed that says, I'm abundant of joy. I'm abundant in fulfillment. I'm abundant in freedom. I'm abundant in money. That's just what it is period okay so that's the consciousness level that we're on now the struggle in the grind that is an old operating system that is an old timeline that we can debunk that we can sever ourselves from that is now over and complete all right so I want to also remind you before we end that if you are desiring more one-on-one -on -one support in your spiritual odyssey, book a call with me. I am taking three people, okay, at the moment, who will be, who will have access to an introductory price, okay? After those three spots fill up, I will be increasing, actually doubling the price of my, my coaching services, okay? So, yeah. <laughs> to find out how to book a call with me, check out the link in the description box of this video. All right. So until next time, cheers.